Good afternoon, or good morning. No, it's good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, now, before I turn to my uh, statement on the subject uh, about which I'd like to speak to you, I'd first like to offer my condolences to the families of those who were killed yesterday in San Bernardino, California. President Obama just spoke about this tragedy. We're monitoring this situation closely in coordination with the rest of the President's national security team. Our highest priority, of course, is the protection of our people. The law enforcement community is taking the lead on this, and they'll be able to provide more information as it becomes available. I'm confident they'll have more answers in the days ahead. Let me now turn to my statement. When I became Secretary of Defense, I made a commitment to building America's force of the future, the all-volunteer military that will defend our nation for generations to come. Like our outstanding force of today, our force of the future must continue to benefit from the best people America has to offer. In the 21st century, that requires drawing strength from the broadest possible pool of talent. This includes women because they make over, up over 50% of the American population. To succeed in our mission of national defense, we cannot afford to cut ourselves off from half the country's talents and skills. We have to take full advantage of every individual who can meet our standards. The Defense Department has increasingly done this in recent decades. In 1975, for example, opening up the military service academies to women, and in 1993, allowing women to fly fighter jets and serve on combat ships at sea. About the same time, though, DOD also issued the Direct Ground Combat Definition and Assignment Rule, which still prohibited women from being assigned to units whose primary mission was engaging in direct ground combat. That rule was in turn rescinded in January 2013, when then Secretary Panetta directed that all positions be opened to qualified women by January 1, 2016, that is, less than one month from today, while also giving the Secretary of the Army, the Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of the Air Force, and the Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command three years to request any exceptions, which would have to be reviewed first by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and then approved by the Secretary of Defense. As many of you know, I was Deputy Secretary of Defense at the time. That decision reflected, among other things, the fact that by that time the issue of women in combat per se was no longer a question. It was a reality because women had seen combat throughout the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, serving, fighting, and in some cases making the ultimate sacrifice alongside their fellow comrades in arms. We've made important strides over the last three years since then. We've seen women soldiers graduate from the Army's Ranger School. We have women serving on submarines. And we've up opened up over 111,000 positions to women across the services. While that represents real progress, it also means that approximately 10 percent of positions through in the military, that is, nearly 220,000, currently remain closed to women, including infantry, armor, reconnaissance, and some special operations units. Over the last three years, the senior civilian and military leaders across the Army Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Special Operations Command have been studying the integration of women into these positions. And last month, I received their recommendations, as well as the data, studies, and surveys on which they were based, regarding whether any of those remaining positions warrant a continued exemption from being opened to women. I reviewed these inputs carefully and today, I'm announcing my decision not to make continued exceptions, that is, to proceed with opening all these remaining occupations and positions to women. There will be no exceptions. 
This means that as long as they qualify and meet the standards, women will now be able to contribute to our mission in ways they could not before. They'll be allowed to drive tanks, fire mortars, and lead infantry soldiers into combat. They'll be able to serve as Army Rangers and Green Berets, Navy SEALs, Marine Corps Infantry, Air Force Parajumpers, and everything else that was previously open only to men. And even more importantly, our military will be better able to harness the skills and perspectives that talented women have to offer. No exceptions was the recommendation of the Secretary of the Army, the Secretary of the Air Force, and the Secretary of the Navy, as well as the Chief of Staff of the Army, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Chief of Naval Operations, and the Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command. While the Marine Corps asked for a partial exception in some areas such as infantry, machine gunner, fire support, reconnaissance, and others, we are a joint force and I have decided to make a decision which applies to the entire force. Let me explain how I came to this decision. First, I've been mindful of several key principles throughout this process. One is that mission effectiveness is most important. Defending this country is our primary responsibility and it cannot be compromised. That means everyone who serves in uniform, men and women alike, has to be able to meet the high standards for whatever job they're in. To be sure, fairness is also important because everyone who's able and willing to serve their country who can meet those standards should have the full and equal opportunity to do so. But the important factor in making my decision was to have access to every American who could add strength to the joint force. Now, more than ever, we cannot afford to have barriers limiting our access to talent. The past three years of extensive studies and reviews leading up to this decision, all of which we're going to post online, by the way, have led to genuine insights and real progress. Where we found that some standards previously were either outdated or didn't reflect the tasks actually required in combat, important work has been done to ensure each position now has standards that are grounded in real-world operational requirements both physical and otherwise, so we're positioned to be better at finding not only the most qualified women, but also the most qualified men for military specialties. Another principle is that the careful implementation of integrating women into combat positions would be a key to success, integration, and also that any decision to do so or not would have to be based on rigorous analysis of factual data. And that's exactly how we've conducted this review. It's been evidence-based and iterative. I'm confident the Defense Department can implement this successfully because throughout our history, we've consistently proven ourselves to be a learning organization. Just look at the last decade and a half. <clears throat> we've seen this in war, where we adapted to counterinsurgency and counterterrorism missions in the wake of 9-11 and in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've seen it technically as new capabilities like unmanned systems and cyber capabilities have entered our inventory. And we've also seen it institutionally when we repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. In every case, our people have mastered change excellently. And they've been able to do so because their leaders have taken care to implement change thoughtfully, always putting the mission and our people first. We will do the same today. As we integrate women into the remaining combat positions, we must keep in mind the welfare and total readiness of our entire force. And as we focus on the individual contributions that each service member makes, we also have to remember that in military operations, teams matter. That's why it's important that the services chose to study both individual performance and team performance. And they not only made comparisons to other elite units, like NASA long-duration flight crews and police SWAT teams. They also worked with our international partners to examine how they have integrated women into ground combat roles. Again, how we implement this is key. As Chairman Dunford has noted, simply declaring all career fields open is not successful integration. 
we must not only continue to implement change thoughtfully, but also track and monitor our progress to ensure we're doing it right, leveraging the skills and strengths of our entire population. All of us have a role to play. As we proceed with full integration of women into combat roles in a deliberate and methodical manner, I'm directing that seven guidelines be used to steer this implementation. First, implementation must be pursued with the clear objective of improved force effectiveness. Leaders must emphasize that objective to all service members, men and women alike. Second, leaders must assign tasks and jobs throughout the force based on ability, not gender. Advancement must be based on objective and validated standards. A good example of this is SOCOM selection processes, which combine objective and subjective criteria in, I quote, a whole person concept that includes rigorous physical standards and also strong moral character, leadership skills, mental agility, problem solving skills, selflessness, maturity, and humility. The third guideline is that for a variety of reasons, equal opportunity likely will not mean equal participation by men and women in all specialties. There must be no quotas or perception thereof. So we will work as a joint force to expertly manage the impacts of what studies may, the studies that have been done suggest may be smaller numbers of women in these fields that were the fields that were previously closed. Fourth, the studies conducted by the services and SOCOM indicate that there are physical and other differences on average between men and women. While this cannot be applied to every man or woman, it is real and must be taken into account in implementation. Thus far, we've only seen small numbers of women qualify to meet our high physical standards in some of our most physically demanding combat occupational specialties. And going forward, we shouldn't be surprised if these small numbers are also reflected in areas like recruitment, voluntary assignment, retention, and advancement in some of these specific specialties. Fifth, we will have to address the fact that some surveys suggest that some service members, both men and women, have a perception that integration would be pursued at the cost of combat effectiveness. Survey data also suggests that women service members emphatically do not want integration to be based on any considerations other than the ability to perform and combat effectiveness. In both cases, based on these surveys, leaders have to be clear that mission effectiveness comes first. And I'm confident that given the, strength of, given the strength of our leaders throughout the ranks, over time, these concerns will no longer be an issue. Sixth, as I noted, both survey data and the judgment of the services leadership strongly indicate that, particularly in the specialties that will be opened, the performance of small teams is important, even as individual performance is important. The seventh guideline has to do with international realities. While we know the United States is a nation committed to using our entire population to the fullest, as are some of our closest friends and allies, we also know that not all nations share this perspective. Our military has long dealt with this reality, notably over the last 15 years in Iraq and also Afghanistan and will need to be prepared to do so going forward as it bears on the specialties that will be opened by this decision. With all these factors in mind, Chairman Dunford recommended that if we were to integrate women into combat positions, then implementation should be done in a combined manner by all the services working together. And I agree, and that will be my direction. Accordingly, I'm directing all the military services to proceed to open all military occupational specialties to women 30 days from today. That is, after a 30-day waiting period required by law, and to provide their updated implementation plans for integrating women into these positions by that date. Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work and Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Paul, General Paul Selva will work with the services to oversee the short-term implementation of this decision 
ensure there are no unintended consequences on the joint force, and periodically update me and Chairman Dunford. Before I conclude, it's important to keep all this in perspective. Implementation won't happen overnight. And while at the end of the day, this will make us a better and stronger force, there still will be problems to fix and challenges to overcome. We shouldn't diminish that. At the same time, we should also remember that the military has long prided itself on being a meritocracy, where those who serve are judged not based on who they are or where they come from, but rather what they have to offer to help defend this country. That's why we have the finest fighting force the world has ever known. And it's one other way we will strive to ensure that the force of the future remains so, long into the future. Today, we take another step toward that continued excellence. Thank you. Now I'll take your questions. Just one moment. Bob? Secretary, uh, you mentioned that the Marine Corps had asked for a partial exception. Uh, the Marine Corps made a very vigorous and detailed case for keeping some uh, combat positions open to men only. In what ways did you find their argument unpersuasive? Uh, I did review the Marine Corps uh, data, surveys, studies. Uh, and also the recommendation of the Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, of course, who was General Dunford, now our Chairman, uh, that certain Marine Corps specialties remain uh, closed to women. Uh, I reviewed that information and I uh, looked at it carefully. I also heard from other leaders of other services who had studied similar issues in their own force. Uh, the recommendations of the other service secretaries and service chiefs, and I came to a different conclusion in respect of those specialties in the Marine Corps. Uh, where I uh, strongly agreed with uh, 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 now Chairman uh, Dunford is two very important points, and I noted them in here. The first is that uh, the key here is going to be implementation. And I, I viewed the, the issues that were raised by all the services, by the way, in varying degrees, and obviously by uh, the Marine Corps, uh, that we needed to take those seriously and address them in implementation. And I believe that the issues raised, including by the Marine Corps, could be addressed successfully in implementation. And second, that there was great value in having a joint or combined approach to implementation. Uh, that's why I have decided to have no exceptions in any service and to have them all working together on implementation. You said, sorry, just a quick follow-up. You said you, you came to a different conclusion, obviously. I, I was asking what about their argument you found uh, lacking? Where uh, because I, I believe that we could, in implementation, address the issues that were raised. Barbara. Um, two things, sir. Um, since you opened up uh, referencing San Bernardino and you said that you're monitoring it closely, can you share with the American people and with troops your, your concerns? Uh, you know, what are you monitoring? What concerns you about this incident? What, what, what's your assessment of the potential growing issue of seeing acts of potentially terrorist-inspired violence in this country, what what does that raise for you? And on this issue that you're discussing here today, can you tell us why General Dunford's not here with you? Sure. Um, okay. On the question of San Bernardino, Barbara, the law enforcement uh, community is investigating what happened there. Again, I'm not going to speculate on what, what, what happens to your general question, obviously protecting our people is our most important um, mission, but we don't know what the causes are of the San Bernardino uh, tragedy, uh, and uh, it, uh, law enforcement, I'm sure, will get to the bottom of that, but I just can't tell you what that is. It's a broader issue that we have seen so many times, though, that, I mean, you on the other day on Capitol Hill, I believe, referenced Chattanooga, um, and you have, you have raised this issue of concern in the past, so I'm just wondering what your latest assessment is of, of how much it worries you. Well, again, we don't know the reasons behind this particular shooting, but the protection of our people, including our service people, and concern about radicalization, including of 
American citizens living in America in the manner that we saw in Chattanooga is a huge, enormous concern. And yet another reason why ISIL needs to be fought and defeated in its heartland of Syria and Iraq, about which I've spoken a great deal, but it's a global uh, campaign, including one that involves law enforcement, homeland security, intelligence, and other elements right here at home. That is the world that uh, we are in, and we need to protect our people in that world. And why is General and, not here, sir? I'm sorry. Why is is well? This I'm announcing my decision. Uh, I was the one who took this decision. I'm announcing my decision. Uh, I you know I should say about General Dunford. You're going to have an opportunity to talk to, to General Dunford. Uh, I've talked to him extensively about this uh, subject. Uh, he's very knowledgeable about it. He will be with me as we proceed with implementation. I have taken m parts of his the conclusions he drew. Others drew different conclusions, including myself. And that's the decision I've taken, and that's the direction we're going to go. Phil? Um, Mr. Secretary, does this decision now uh, lead to an, a, a greater debate about whether women need to register for selective service? Um, as it, it, it may do that, Phil. I, that, that, that is uh, a matter of uh, legal dispute right now, and in fact, litigation, so I can't I don't, I, I don't uh, know how that uh, uh, will turn out. I, by the way, the, the, uh, the, the legal, that legal determination won't affect what I announced today. That is our timetable for the implementation of the decisions I've announced today. But it is an issue that's out there. Unfortunately, it's subject to, um, to, um, to litigation. Jennifer? Jay Carter, the three women who made it through the Ranger School, will they now be welcomed into the Ranger Regiment? Will uh, they become a part of the regiment? Because they weren't until now. Those, those positions will now be available to women. Once again, just to remind you, you have people have to qualify for, for positions. Positions have to be open, uh, and so forth. So the, the, there's a lot that goes into it, but the, those positions will now be open to them, yes. Secondly, can we assume that you found the Marine Corps study which concluded that mixed gender units aren't as capable as male units to be flawed? Uh, it's it just not definitive, not determinative. There are other issues other than the, those, uh, uh, study, those studies are reflective of something I spoke of, which is teams do matter. And we need to take that into account. Uh, and at the same time, the, the individual's capabilities and the, the, the capabilities of the individual to contribute are extremely important. On average, and I said this very directly, men and women will have different physical capabilities. I'm, I, we, the, the data show that clearly. Now, that's on average. So there will be women who can meet the physical requirements of these specialties, even as there are men who cannot meet those uh, requirements. Uh, and so averages uh, tell you something about the need to pay attention to numbers, team dynamics, and so forth, uh, but they do not uh, uh, determine whether an individual is qualified to participate in a given uh, unit. Mr. Secretary? Let me just see. Tom, yeah, please. Yeah. The general that uh, led this Marine Corps study said in a memo to then Commandant Joe Dunford that opening up ground combat jobs would increase the risk, meaning more casualties for Marines. I wonder what you think about that, or is that statement overblown? And also, I understand one of uh, General Dunford's concerns was since women, and women in the experimental unit uh, suffered more uh, injuries mm -hmm. than men, that he was concerned that you would lose some hard-charging women Marines. I wanted you to think about that. Yeah, well. uh, no, uh, 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 both of those. I mean, first of all, to the first point, combat effectiveness is the critical criterion in implementation. So the issue that you read, your first quote dealt with is something that must be dealt with, and I believe can be dealt with, in implementation. So it needs to be taken into account. It's a serious issue. Combat effectiveness is why we're here. Uh, with respect to, I'm sorry, your second point, Tom, was? 
Well, the concern was that some of the women in the experimental battalion that they put through the oh, training. Oh, yeah. No. For, no. The concern uh, is that you would lose some hard-charging women Marines due to injury. Yes, there are a number of studies that indicated that. Again, that's something that doesn't doesn't suggest to me that women shouldn't be admitted to those uh, specialties if they're qualified, but it's going to something that is, needs gonna, that's going to need to be taken into account uh, in implementation. So these are real phenomena that are affect gender and uh, that are uh, rather affected by gender and need to be taken into account in implementation. The Marines, Marine Corps has concluded that it would harm combat effectiveness. And that's something that Secretary Panetta mentioned when he... Combat effectiveness is the critical criterion. And it, this uh, change will be in, uh, uh, implemented, and I am confident can be implemented in a way that will enhance combat effectiveness, not detract from combat effectiveness. Mick? Uh, Mr. Secretary, well, uh, 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 the women's desire to enter combat roles or missions be entirely voluntary, or will there be a time to where they could, uh, like many of their male counterparts, be required to go into combat mission? I, 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 absolutely. If you're a service member, you have some choices, but you don't have absolute, absolute choice. Uh, people are assigned to missions, tasks, and functions according to need as well as their capabilities, and women will be subject to the same uh, standards and rules that men will. So are you concerned, as you alluded to in your opening remarks, uh, that that could actually <coughs> cause women not to want to enlist in the military if they thought there was a possibility they would be required to go into a combat role? Well, I, I presume there are people in general, men and women, who don't join the military because they don't want to live uh, by the military's rules and standards. But that's they, they don't join. It's an all-volunteer uh, force. But if you do decide to join, you're subject to our rules and standards, period. Jamie. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to get back to the uh, absence of uh, General Dunford because um, Given that he was the only service chief that asked for an exemption of all, all of them, and given that he's now the senior military advisor, wouldn't it be important for him to be here and to send the message that the U.S. military is ready to salute smartly and carry out your orders? Because his absence may be sending an unintended message that he's not fully on board with your decision. Uh, uh, General Dunford and I have discussed this many, many times. I just met with him and the other chiefs and service secretaries uh, today, and uh, he will be a full part of implementation. And as I said, I came to a different judgment about a part of the conclusions of the studies that were conducted by the Marine Corps when he was commandant, but agreed with the, uh, the great bulk of them, and they will be reflected in implementation. The issues that were raised by those studies, I believe, can be addressed in implementation and will be. That's my judgment, uh, and he understands that's my judgment, and we will, he will be at my side as we do the implementation. That's the idea. Your decision. Well, you'll have to speak to him about that, but he understands what my decision is, and my decision is my decision, and we will uh, uh, implement it accordingly. Let me see. Gordon. Where's Gordon? Hi, Gordon. Hi. I, I wonder if we can move on to a different subject uh, briefly, is uh, the shooting down of the Russian jet. I wonder if you could just give us an assessment a little bit more of um, how that complicates the issue and if uh, Turkey over reached on on that shooting down of the jet? Uh, well, uh, I, I mean, first of all, we said repeatedly, the president said the Turks are uh, entitled to defend their own airspace. Um, we have urged both sides not to allow this uh, to uh, uh, lead to further escalation. Uh, it has not had any effect on our prosecution of our own uh, air campaign. We, uh, as you know, have a memorandum of understanding with the uh, Russian military, which is being adhered to and which uh, is um, uh, 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 provides procedures that guarantee the um, uh, operations of our, our own air campaign unimpeded. I mean, with respect to the relations between uh, uh, Turkey and, and Russia, um, uh, we obviously have our differences of perspective with Russia about what is going on in 
in Syria. That doesn't translate, in our judgment, into any desire to see a conflict of any kind between Russia and, and, and Syria. And, uh, and Turkey, for its part, is a member of our coalition. Uh, and uh, they're working with us in some regards. Obviously, we'd like them, like many other members of the coalition, to do more uh, in, um, in Syria and Iraq against Could ISIL. follow up on that. Is, what do you think it would take? You know, obviously, the U.S. is pressing Turkey to do more in different levels, particularly, though, this cordon of forces along a stretch of the border to, to uh, help uh, eliminate the flow of foreign fighters. What do you think it will take for Turkey to kind of agree to do that and move forward? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, my, in my view, they have ample evidence of ISIL's uh, da the danger ISIL poses to their own, pe their own people in their own country. Uh, we also uh, understand the other dangers they face, um, but they need to join in the fight against ISIL. I think there is more that they could do. Uh, it involves their military, it involves their intelligence services, it involves their border uh, and homeland security forces. So we would like to see Turkey do more. It's essential. Tony? I want to tie together the fight against ISIL with your decision today. The fact that SOCOM did not press for any exemptions, does that in theory mean that women over the next year could become part of the specialized counterterrorism commando units that you want to accelerate in the fight against ISIL, like the Specialized Targeting Expeditionary Task Force you announced the other, that, other day. That, 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 that is, yes, that is reflected in my decision. It was, as you said, also reflected in the recommendation of the commander of the Special Operations uh, uh, Command. Um, and I, uh, I saw it the same way. And therefore, my decision is the same as the decision of General Votel, or the recommendation of General Votel. Uh, in this case. Um, and as far as the time scale goes, Tony, I mean, remember that, with the, that uh, the, from the time a service member joins to the time they're assigned to a specialty, undergo training and so forth, it, 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 so people will be going through the pipeline, including women, who are uh, admitted pursuant to my decision today. Kevin. Thank you, Mr. On some the same vein, were there any of the MOSs or jobs particularly um, that were in need of more women? Where, meaning the service secretaries and, and all their recommendations up to you say, this is actually where, where we actually could use more here or there because you know, the military is at capacity, you're over 100 percent, you're actually shrinking the size of the force. Um, and the second question to follow up on those targeting uh, expeditionary forces. Uh, could you ex explain to us when that when those get started or they're already started? You mentioned one of their jobs specifically was to capture ISIS leaders. When they do that, what happens to them? It's a big question you haven't heard from your level yet. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, two uh, things. Uh, well, there are uh, Kevin specialties, uh, and I don't want to go into this too much, but there that that are. Uh, uh, designed specifically uh, for, for women. These are uh, women who are part of female engagement teams uh, and so forth in places where <clears throat> it is sensitive for an American male service member to interact with local females. So there are, um, and I was alluding to that in my, my statement, so there are situations like that. Um, I suppose it's also uh, fair to say that this is a statistical thing, not doesn't apply to individuals, but there are specialties in which um, women have historically excelled. And you have to be careful about that because that's sometimes a, a matter of where, where they felt they could advance rather than anything else. But uh, so women are, are, are represented um, differently across specialties that have long been uh, open, and that's why I think that we really need to focus on standards as we f go into implementation. And um, uh, we're going to learn a lot, and we already have learned, and the service studies and surveys suggest this um, about standards and about how to think about standards in the course of considering this matter of of, uh, of gender. With respect to the expeditionary uh, targeting force and capture, we will deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. It's going to depend uh, on the circumstances. Um, uh, uh, 
And uh, that is, of course, just one of the purposes of the Expeditionary Targeting Force, but it is one, uh, capture. And um, uh, we will be doing such operations, as you know, both in uh, 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 Syria and also in Iraq. And just to repeat what I said the other day, uh, when we do it in Iraq, it will be with the uh, 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 knowledge and approval of the Iraqi government and Prime Minister Abadi, just to make that uh, once again quite clear. Well, so would it be and with that, options, so you see it possible that an ISIS fighter could be um, the full range, either military. There's uh, a full range, as all, yeah, the, all the way, and 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 other uh, law enforcement of other of other uh, of other nations. So the full range, and it really has to be considered on a case by case basis. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here.